All right, well, welcome back to Exhaust Sports Auto. My name is Kevin, and we are here to check out, well, two vehicles, actually, a 2018 Mustang GT Premium, as well as the 2020 Mustang EcoBoost, uh, high-performance EcoBoost, excuse me, with a manual transmission. So, why am I doing this? Because I've actually already driven a PP2 Mustang last year. It was a 2019, it was that green one. I'll link that below. And the 2020, that's also a press car I got for a week. So I've had that for about six days now. So it's the last day I have with the vehicle. So I decided to do a comparison with this GT Premium with the automatic because I've never driven a Mustang with the automatic and I've never driven the PP1 Mustang before. So that'll be a pretty good test. This vehicle has about 21,000 miles. So it's a good way to test how it's aged a little bit. And also to check out this automatic most importantly, because you know, some people, they just can't drive a manual or they don't want to deal with it in traffic. So uh, I will never really kill anybody who wants to own an EcoBoost nor an automatic because people have their needs either fuel economy or you know health wise they can use a left leg to you know operate a clutch you know things like that so that's why I'm here to check out these different models and compare the two to see what's up. Special thank you to European Performance. You can have a little discount if you mention my name. I don't get anything out of it. If you talk to Ryan on any vehicle that they have here, they actually focus more on European vehicles. However, they have this Mustang GT, so I decided to take advantage of it. So all their information will be down in the description box below. But let's just get this bad boy out on the road because I'm very curious to try what this thing is gonna be like. I will say the, um, the GT is definitely the vehicle to have, no doubt about that. And I mean, really, honestly, if you want to own this thing, I mean, you got to have it with the manual. You know, if you want to own it the way God intended you to drive it, then yeah, you got to have the GT PP1 with the manual. But at least this is a PP1. This is the spec that I recommend most people to get. So let's just bust this turn and see what it does. It is great, but um, it's not the fastest thing in the world, not even the GT is, and I said this in the PP2 review I did, that's not what this thing is. However, this is, you know, I have a Lexus LC500 personally, and that car is not the fastest vehicle you can get for the money. However, this car is similar to the LC500 in some ways. And I'm not gonna talk about how it looks because you already know what it looks like. And when I say that this vehicle is similar to the LC500, it's got like this glorious five liter V8 under the hood. Now this is 2018, this is the model year to get if you're in the used market, 2018's enough, man. They made a lot of great changes under the hood. That was a big one. This V8 produces 460 horsepower and about 420 pounds feet of torque. This is up from the 420 horsepower, like the 400 pounds feet of torque, I believe that the old car used to have. But you know, we have a little sport mode here that we kind of put it into, kind of puts you in a higher gear a little bit. And what it does is, makes it a lot louder. It was so fast to turn on the wiper, so that's interesting anyway that back and drive kind of holds the gears a little bit too much there but 2018 they made it louder the exhaust is so much louder than before i mean it's a huge change from 2017 so this is definitely the model year to take advantage of it's also the year where they gave you the 10 speed automatic for the first time i think before it was like a six speed auto or whatever so i mean is this a good transmission i mean we'll test more of that in a bit but the paddles seem to be reacting pretty good Yeah, this, this transmission is definitely reacting pretty pretty good, actually. And it is very loud. I don't know if you can tell, but that is a glorious exhaust note, dude. This thing is just perfect. And that's why it reminds me so much of the LC500. You have like this naturally aspirated engine that revs out so high, past 7,000 RPM. And it's just glorious to hear it wind out. And I love that. This motor, this 5 liter Coyote has so much more character than the Camaro V8 and Actually, between the Challenger and the Camaro, uh, it's much like how Savage Geese actually described it. This is actually the vehicle that kind of sits in between the two cars, actually. they, Because this is a very comfortable and refined vehicle. That's another big change that they made for 2018 over the prior generation cars or prior years, actually, because this now gets the Magna Ride suspension. And I mean, it rides like a luxury car, I swear to you. I mean, it has some other unrefined characteristics, like it's a very buzzy interior. Like there's a lot of like, when you get on the accelerator, 
like the panels up top here, they tend to rattle a little bit, you know, stuff like that. It's very prevalent in the EcoBoost because it's only a four cylinder, not as smooth as these uh, V8s are. But yeah, I'm liking this transmission and this mag ride is a mandatory thing. It just makes this like such a daily drivable vehicle. Overall, the bumps, and it's the same thing with the EcoBoost. The high performance one I have also has the, uh, the Magna Ride suspension, and it is a mandatory thing. You can do so many miles in these vehicles, and you'll never be fatigued. I had that uh, EcoBoost for about a week now, and I put about 200 miles on it. I was never once fatigued driving that car. Now, I'm gonna check out some of that handling here in a little bit. Now, here's the thing with the handling. Now, that's kind of its main deficiency I have with this vehicle. This is not as sharp as, like, the Camaros are, but it's not as like comfy and stuff as like the uh, Challengers or not as practical as a Challenger. But it's a good middle ground between the two, but there's definitely, um, there is a disconnect I feel driving this car, both in the steering and the suspension. I don't know what it is, but it kind of neuters my driving confidence here. And I'm about to test a little bit of that here. This thing is riding on 19 inch wheels. gripping pretty well. I can feel it losing the uh, the rear end. However, it's not enough for you to like catch it. You know, you don't, I don't really know exactly what the rear end is doing in this thing. That's the only sucky part about it. There's a lack of communication with this car. Otherwise, it's a capable car. I drove the PP2, it's very capable. The feedback is not there for you to uh, catch it. That's probably why so many people, they just like put this thing into a ditch, which is unfortunate because, but that's okay. This thing is ro rocking the 19 inch wheel. Sorry, I got distracted and I think this is the perfect tire size that this thing has going on it's got 255 wide tires up front 275s in the rear my EcoBoost I'm driving now is 265s in all four corners and the PP2 at 305 Michelin Cup 2 tires that was insane it was tram lining everywhere it was following all the road imperfections it was very jerky this is not jerking the steering wheel at all my EcoBoost that one kind of is when I go over the bumps it gets unsettled and kind of like jerks the steering wheel again another thing that kind of detracts from the the confidence I have in the vehicle but again like I mentioned it's a great cruiser this vehicle is also rocking the Pilot 4S tire which is a great tire provides a lot of grip these uh, summer tires however they can be a little bit noisy this is already not the most refined cabin space the ride is extremely refined but um, it's a little bit more tinny in here you know you hear uh, the, the tire noise come through a little bit and all that good stuff but as a whole I am not complaining about the way that this vehicles uh the the on-road performance it's excellent and that's what i really appreciate about it but because you have this automatic let's be honest you're going to be getting way better fuel economy i mean than a manual car especially me driving that eco boost where i'm getting about 17 mpg this one i guess the previous person was trashing on it so it's getting about 10 that's the thing if you're gonna be trashing on this car of course it's not gonna get good fuel economy expect to get like 12 13 city but with the automatic if you're pretty mellow with it if you're pretty casual with it it's not too bad but if you, you know step on it Yeah, this car, it definitely has a better sensation of speed than the manuals do, that's for sure. I'll give it that. And don't get me wrong, 460 horse, but I mean, this is more than enough for, you know, street driving. I think this is a great street car. It's a lot like the LC500. It's like the budget LC, basically, uh, just with a teeny interior. This is easily the model I recommend. This is the perfect Mustang, a PP1 with 255 wide tires up front, 275s in the rear, uh, this GT, and get it with either this automatic or with a manual. Um, I know the manuals had a few issues with it. I mean, it's a, it's a very fragile manual system, actually. I think it was like the shifting forks or something like that. I, think, I don't know if it was a recall, but it's definitely a known issue with the vehicle. I would still get the manual regardless, but this 10 speed is very good. If you need to have an automatic, this is not a bad one. So it kind of, it's definitely doing a great job sticking. I think this is a good tire choice for this vehicle, these Michelins. The brakes are tremendous, man. These. GT brakes. These are the same brakes I have in the EcoBoost. You have to get deep in it and it gets really great stopping power. I absolutely love these brakes, man. These are tremendous. It's got a great tone to it, just idling too. And that's that's a satisfactory thing about this vehicle. Otherwise, everything else, you know, from the Mustang all kind of, you know, stays the same, like the steering feel and all that good stuff. That's, that's really great right there. Okay, so we're done driving the vehicle. And before we get into the EcoBoost, 
let's talk about this interior because it's pretty much identical to it. I mean, this is the premium model, so it does get a few little options here. I believe this model did get the Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, all that good stuff. This one also has some other niceties like the heated and cooled seats. However, I had the cooled seats on. It's not really cooling anything. It might just be a ventilated seat. I don't know, but I love the toggle switches. That's great. Yeah, same kind of, you know, Sync 3 or whatever the hell this thing is. Reacts the exact same. I mean, it's a pretty cheap looking infotainment screen, but whatever. Uh, like I mentioned, you get paddles now for this uh, automatic and they react great, but um, they are some cheap plastic looking paddles, but again, at least you have them. And you do have automatic headlights. That's a great thing. And the steering wheel, like I mentioned, I do love this steering wheel because it has like this old school feel to it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like this big old round thing and it's a uh, old school, like seventies feel, I suppose sixties feel. So that's great. Now gauge cluster, this one has the traditional gauge cluster here, but this was the first year where they offered that 12.3 inch screen. I have it in the EcoBoost right now and it's not bad. I don't mind it. It looked kind of cheap in the videos when I first saw it, but actually now that I've experienced it in person, the, uh, the 12.3 inch, it's not half bad actually. It, it looks pretty decent but I, this is fine. You know, I love the traditional tachometer and speedometer. This is actually still my preference. And you do have like this little center screen here and, and it does definitely show you some good information. However, I wish it was just better organized. That's my only gripe with it. Now the rest of the interior, of course, is very tinny and all that stuff. It's very plasticky, cheap plastics being used, but even with 21,000 miles, it's aged. I mean, it feels just like a new Mustang does. So that's pretty good. I get it. it's only 21, but there's not an insane amount of creaking and rattling, I guess, because this is a smoother V8 engine like I don't feel quite as many vibrations just like the nice aggressive sound of that vehicle so of, of the engine yeah one touch auto up and down windows it's not double pane glass or anything like that don't expect that in a vehicle like this you know the sound system sounds all right nothing unbelievable or anything like that but you know I, I forgive this interior because this is not some ridiculous three hundred thousand dollar Ferrari that nobody can have you know the pictures of this is what should be on your wall not like Ferraris and Lambos and things like that because for between 30 to $45,000, this is unbelievable what Ford has given you, like the Camaro, the Challenger, like all three of these cars. I love all three of them because these are the obtainable cars that normal humans can have. Legitimate performance, satisfactory performance for street driving, so that's great. So I forgive all of this interior. I don't care. I don't care about this plastic looking aluminum thing that's going on. I don't care about that. I will say the things that matter, like these seats, these seats are so freaking comfortable. Another thing that aids in you being able to drive this for a long time without being fatigued. Another thing, these doors aren't super heavy. And for a coupe, it's so easy for me to get in and out of this thing. So if you're a little bit elderly, that's a big advantage that this vehicle has. So that's great. Oh, and speaking of seat, let me tell you something. This seat belt, right? This is hell in the other Mustangs I've tried. Like the PP2 I had and the EcoBoost I have right now, the freaking thing would keep like slipping off and I would have to reach back every single time. I mean, that was so obnoxious. This one, it has like a, a nice leather strap like you get in a luxury car and it stays in place. It's always connected to the, uh, to the seat every time you move it forward, back, doesn't matter. So it's so much easier to get to this uh, to the seat belt. I don't know if that's just an option of a of a uh, the premium trim or something like that, but whatever it is, that is amazing. Look for that when you go to buy a Mustang. That is a lifesaver for me. Sounds like a small thing, but when you live with the car, that seatbelt always going back there, like 20 feet behind you, that gets very annoying. So this car fixes that. That's great. Now I guess another thing before we talk about the rear seats, I hate how you you have an electric seat here for the uh, the driver's seat. However, to kind of recline like forward and back, you have a mechanical lever. That's just kind of dumb. If you're gonna make it electric, just make the whole thing electric, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of annoying, uh, but whatever. But yeah, the rear seats, they're okay. You know, I'm five foot 11. You can use it in a pinch. I can fit behind myself, but I do sit closer to the steering wheel than most five foot 11 people probably would. So there is that. Headroom is not even remotely an issue and there's no sunroof here. So that's also helping with the rigidity of this car and also giving you more headroom. So that's nice. But here's the thing. This car is extremely practical. You know, you can definitely fit smaller people back there. That's not an issue. You know, this is not a family sedan, so I don't really care about it, but it's nice to know that you can use those seats. But most importantly, that trunk space is great and you can even fold down these seats despite it being a rear wheel drive car. So this is the biggest advantage that this car has over the Camaro. I still prefer the Camaro for the driving. I think it's a superior car as a whole. However, practicality wise, that car is worthless and the trunk is worthless as well because the opening isn't that big on the Camaro. This one, it is just 
so much larger of an opening, bigger trunk, and you can fold down the seats. It is great. It's not as practical as the Challengers are, uh, but that's a humongous car, so that's the thing. This is kind of like that middle ground vehicle, so there is that. Now, with all that established, let's go ahead and let's get inside the EcoBoost, and let's end this little review slash comparison off. Okay, so now we're inside of the manual high-performance EcoBoost Mustang. So let's get this bad boy out on the road. Now, I will say, I'll start out with the exterior this time because, you know, if you look over the B-roll, I mean, both of these cars, the EcoBoost and that GT PP1 I just reviewed, they both look identical from the outside. And to the point where actually a lot of people have been taking notice to this vehicle when I'm driving and people think it's like some V8 like super cool Mustang it's got like the same kind of splitter up in the front the same quad tip exhaust and the same old diffuser design in the back as well it's very cool I mean it's a, it's a phenomenal looking car especially in this blue it is beautiful I, I love the way this car looks but you know <laughs> you look in the side it does not have GT logos on the side or a 5 liter badge on the side it has like this old 2.3 high performance badge on the side it wears the 2.3 very proudly and uh, I guess they should. I mean, this is the exact same motor that you get in the Focus RS. You know, it looks slightly detuned here. It's about like 332 horsepower, but an amazing 350 pounds feet of torque. But I will, I will say this right now, this is nowhere near as quick as like the, uh, the V8s are, especially in terms of thrust. I mean, it's very good, don't get me wrong, but it's nothing like unbelievable, honestly. The, uh, the GT Mustang was very powerful. I will give it that. Uh, construction, all this nonsense going on. Yeah, this is um, this is definitely effortless thrust. Don't get me wrong. So, this is clearly more than enough for the street driving. But it's just like it doesn't give you like that pitting sensation in your stomach. That's the thing. This will effortlessly get up to speed. And I will say the five liter, uh, especially with that automatic, it, it really does give you more of a thrusting sensation uh, because it's it's very good at downshifting. I'll give it that. When you need the power, when you request it, it will absolutely deliver. So that's pretty great, but still I would recommend you getting that uh, that manual with that car. But the V8 is a very uh, peaky car. It makes all the power up at the top end, very similar to the LC500. This is supposed to technically give you all the thrust down low, but even still, it's not really doing that for me. But again, it's fine. Again, I don't ridicule anybody for getting the EcoBoost or the, uh, the automatic. This is the manual, of course but you could get the automatic if you wanted to. It's about $1,500 option. This EcoBoost, I've been trashing it, hitting all these uh, all these downshifts, you know what I'm saying? Practicing my little heel toes and all that stuff every chance I get and flooring it, and I'm still getting about 17 MPG. So that's pretty excellent, you know, a little second gear, heel toe right there. Very easy to do that. That's another thing I'll mention. This manual feels a lot superior to the, um, to the PP2 Mustang I drove last year, the 2019. Something about it is just far better. Something about it, I mean, the clutch uptake is better, the shifter feel as a whole, I mean, it's just, it's all much superior in this car. And I, I never once stalled this vehicle. It was so easy to get used to. Uh, actually, I think I did stall the PP2 once. Yeah, I, no, I definitely did. I remember I was at a red light and I stalled. I didn't panic because these idiots get in my way all the time, so I didn't care, but I'm just saying. I did, in fact, um, the clutch uptake was just not as predictable as it is in this car. I can't, I didn't find anything where they mentioned that they changed the manual transmission or they improved it, but somehow it does feel a little bit better to me, a little bit sharper, so I appreciate that. So I'll kind of launch it right here. See, I mean, it, effort, it effortlessly gets up there. It's about like a 6,500 RPM uh, red line in this thing. Uh, the V8 obviously revved out over 7,000. That's amazing. I love that. One of the highest revving V8s you'll ever get. But the main thing that's lacking here, I, I really don't mind the, uh, the speed at all because both of these cars are perfectly calibrated for straight driving, like the power band, essentially. The thing I don't like is like this boomy four-cylinder sound that this thing makes. It, like... I mentioned in the review, like Ford cannot make a good sounding like six cylinder turbo or a four cylinder turbo. It's just not what they're good at. Now this thing will pop occasionally. Didn't really do it that time, even when I shifted it the second, but that's another thing. When you downshift a lot like that, 
I noticed like this four cylinder, it vibrates a lot. So like the front dash kind of vibrates along with it. So that kind of, uh, if you're a stickler for that whole thing, I mean, it does vibrate a little bit more, especially when you downshift like that. And there is no rev match feature in this vehicle, which shocks me. Uh, it's very strange to me because you would think like the four cylinder EcoBoost, that's like some people's like first manual car or first sports car, if you will. Yet yeah, it does not have the, uh, the rev match function. The only the V8 manuals get that. Yeah, I'm gonna test out the handling here in a little bit, but here's the thing though. I mean, they pretty much feel identical. Um, both these cars, this one also has like the Magna Ride suspension. Both vehicles obviously still use a strut-based suspension up front and a multi-link in the rear. However, both these vehicles are all fitted with a Magna Ride and man, these things, they ride so freaking good. I will say this vehicle is a little bit quieter on the tire noise department because these 265 all four corner 19 inch wheels and tire setup it's like these pirelli summer tires that are kind of bespoke to this high performance mustang so something about these pirellis they are a little bit quieter than those michelins but obviously the michelins grip a lot better i think uh, the michelins also make the mustang feel a little bit more predictable but you have to keep in mind the uh the pp1 gts have a 255 wide tire in the front not a 265 like it is in here yeah very easy manual to drive it's like the perfect like first manual car if you will uh, i don't know how many you know, kids are getting this as like, as like their first manual or whatever. But like, if you do, this is a pretty easy one to get used to. And like I mentioned, you get way better gas mileage in this than you would an equivalent uh, GT Mustang. In pretty much most real world scenarios, no matter how you drive, this will probably net you about five MPG better in real world driving. If you're getting, since I'm annihilating this car and getting 17 MPG, if I annihilated the GT, I'll probably get about 12. 13 mpg something like that so if you're gonna daily drive this car if you're looking at this solely for like it's manual or even it's automatic you just like the way this car looks then take advantage of the looks and know that you're still getting a great performing four cylinder technically on paper this thing will do zero to 60 in about high fours i believe especially with the automatic i mean the automatic is very quick i'll give it that yeah, especially if you got this with the EcoBoost, I think even Ford was saying that the uh, EcoBoost is best paired with the 10-speed automatic. And you'll probably get really great uh, gas mileage there. So if you want a cool looking daily, go for it. There's no ridiculing there. I will say, however, though, if you want the EcoBoost, I would say get the regular EcoBoost, not this high performance one. I don't think it's worth the money. That's the main thing. The regular EcoBoost still produces 310 uh, horsepower and about 350 pounds for your torque. It's the same torque figure, even if you got the regular EcoBoost. So there is that. See, it grips just like the, uh, the V8 does. That makes sense because this utilizes a lot of the same you know, gear as the uh, the GT PP1 does. Like you get the same brakes essentially. I did notice that the brakes on the PP1 are the um, the Brembos. This is not have Brembos. I think this has the same brakes as a regular base model GT does. Oh, which is still great. I'm still loving the brake pedal. It still feels identical to the PP1 I just drove. Great stopping power. You had to get in on the uh, the brakes, and it's phenomenal stopping power. So I love that. So in conclusions, you know, the interior is pretty much the exact same. The main change I noticed with the premium is that it gets cooled seats. I think it gets a few other things. You can definitely get a few safety options if you wanted to, like blind spot monitoring, all that good stuff. It's like a separate little package. And you get like a lane departure warnings and all that good stuff. And over these like stupid bumps, man, it's uh, absorbing all of them. You just get like this old rattly little cabin. I have about 6,700 uh, miles on this particular vehicle. But yeah, anyway, you can get a uh, lane departure. You can get like a forward collision warning, all that stuff if you wanted to. But yeah, in conclusions, I mean, it's the exact same interior space. So I'm not really going to go through that again. And obviously you can watch my EcoBoost review I did just on this vehicle. So that'll go into more details and definitely check out my PP2 review I did. But yes, as a whole my absolute number one pick for the mustang is a pp1 2018 and up manual transmission v8 however if you can't get that the 10 speed is great and also this eco boost this manual at least for 2020 it's excellent um or else step it up to the gt350 i've heard that thing is very epic i would like to try that so 
you have any more questions, leave them down in the comment section below. If you're an owner, please do share your thoughts, you know, EcoBoost or V8, let me know. I don't think that this handles as well as a Camaro, and I don't think this is quite as comfy as a Challenger, but it sits in, in between. My main problem is like the slight disconnect I have with the steering and the suspension. It really neuters my confidence. That's my primary gripe I have with this car, but it's a phenomenal street car. Very enjoyable, very satisfactory, so I appreciate it for those reasons. So. Thank you again for watching. Take care and goodbye.